بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على النبي الكريم وبعد moving on in our sessions and our circles of knowledge that which we seek by it nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala foremost and that which we seek through the likes of these circles that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to be amongst the people that tread a path to Jannah, a people that when once they take their first step out of their home, they're in a state of jihad fi sabilillah. As a man in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on search of knowledge. That is the reward. A person is deprived from that reward when he misses out from the likes of these circles in the house of Allah Taala, It is encouraged that a person has endurance. The moment you step out of your home with the intention to go to the mosque and to learn an ayah or ayats from the book of Allah or a hadith from the noble messenger Muhammad wasallam, then it is greater to you than what, that which lies of this worth lies in this earth of the pressures of wealth and what people may have a possession so it's upon us to constantly renew our intentions constantly take yourself to account when you come to the likes of these gatherings once you're sincere wallahi wa billah you'll find the fruits of these circles and inshallah in in front of Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala, the one does not oppress any of his servants. So moving on with this booklet, Aqidatul Wasatiyah, written by the author, as we mentioned before, the illustrious scholar, the brilliant Mufassir, the man that excelled and surpassed many of his contemporary scholars along with him, in fact, surpassed even some scholars that lived before him. And there is no man from that time to our era the like of him. Shaykh Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah. It doesn't, he doesn't require a biography from ourselves. He doesn't require for us to go any further to identify him. Just hearing his name is sufficient for him. It's sufficient that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raised his mentioning li sharaf al-ilm wa li sharaf al-ma'lum due to the honor of knowledge that is the state and the level of knowledge that even after your death you're mentioning dhikruk yuhya fi majalis you're mentioning your name is still alive in the presence of the righteous this is Shaykh Islam ibn Taymiyyah. This booklet, Aqidatul Wasatiyah, where we were moving on to going into the detailed understanding of what was expressed concerning the principles and the beliefs of Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah regarding the names and attributes of Allah. It's a shame that. We have to, yani in our own ranks of people that ascribe themselves to Islam, we have to defend Islam from the people that even ascribe themselves to Islam. People attacking Islam under the name of Islam. That's the unfortunate part. You find that each one of us is targeted. Yourself, yani the closest of people to you, of kinship is targeted with mysterious characters that go and spread these doubts. They spread these doubts, they even perhaps make videos online. No name whatsoever, anonymous names, people that have no yeah, any source to what they're mentioning, and they're then they're attacking Ahl Sunnah in this field of the names and attributes of Allah. You find that they label Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah with the worst of names concerning this field. 
They have even perhaps taken Ahlul Sunnah out of the fold of Islam with some of their nicknames. They say they are the people of blasphemy, people of apostasy, people who resemble Allah to His creation. And they don't stop there. They go on with nicknames we're going to mention. But Alhamdulillah, this is Sunnatullah in the face of spreading the truth. If Prophet Muhammad in Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or before that, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lam yaslam, if Allah wasn't safe from the revilement of the people of fitna, distortion, and corruption, of their lies, then who are the people in regards to defending the truth? They are a greater preference going to be attacked. So it's only upon us to be patient when learning these affairs, and to continue to spread it and teach it to our family members. So we took an introduction, all of what was taken or taken of uh, the words of the two sessions of principles and layouts. All of that was an introduction. Now Sheikh Islam and Taymiyyah, he's going to go further by giving examples from the Book of Allah and examples from the Hadith of the Noble Messenger Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that attest to what he expressed, the principles. This is Shaykh Islam Taymiyyah in this booklet. He's going to move on with that. Affair. He mentions approximately 110 verses to prove his point from the Book of Allah and approximately 16 ahadith to prove his point, but he starts with the verses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the Noble Book. Then he goes on to mention a hadith. So he's going to uh, mention topics that have been under dispute or the people of innovations have argued regarding. So we're going to see that and who specifically from the people of innovations have uh, put forward their arguments concerning these attributes of Allah. So I'm going to read the Arabic and I'm going to allow the brother to read the translation where Shaykh Islam Atimiya says, وَقَدْ دَخَلَ فِي هَذِهِ الْجُمْلَةِ وَقَدْ دَخَلَ فِي هَذِهِ الْجُمْلَةِ مَا وَصَفَ بِهِ نَفْسَهُ فِي سُورَةِ الْإِخْلَاسِ الَّتِي تَعْدِلُ ثُلُثَ الْقُرْآنِ حَيْثُ يَقُولُ قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدِ اللَّهُ الصَّمَدِ لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد تفضل The following is included in this idea of how Allah describes himself in Surah Al-Ikhlas chapter 112 which equals the third of the Quran where he says Say, He is Allah, the one, Allah, the external. He never begot, nor was He begotten. begotten. <coughs> there is none comparable to Him. And He described Himself in the greatest ayah verse in, the, in His book, Ayat of Kursi. Here, Shaykh Islam ibn Taymiyyah, he mentions that what comes to clarify what was mentioned of principles concerning what was attributed to Allah of, or what was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described with is the clear layout of all these principles found in Surah Al-Ikhlas. All these principles that we just mentioned, you can find them in Surah Al-Ikhlas. Surah that is considered to be the best surah after Surah Al-Fatiha. So for that reason, he starts with this example. Then you're going to see that he starts with the greatest verse in the Qur'an. If Surah Al-Ikhlas, as some scholars have mentioned, is the second best surah in the Qur'an, what is the third? Who knows what's the third best surah in the Qur'an? Huh? Someone says Surah Baqarah. 
What is the third best surah in the Quran? Surah Yasin, huh? MashaAllah. Any other? The first was Surah Al Fatiha. The second we mentioned, or opinion of a number of scholars, is Surah Al Ikhlas. Huh? Surah Al Kahf, huh? MashaAllah. Surat Qul Ya Ayyuha Al Kafirun. Because it comes in a hadith, it is Rub Al Quran. What is the meaning of Rub Al Quran? Huh? One fourth of the Quran. So, for that reason, some have mentioned that it is the third best surah in the Quran, and others have said the third is Surah Al Baqarah. Because the Prophet وسلم, said in a hadith, that everything had to speak and the peak of the Qur'an is Surah Al-Baqarah and also being that it has the greatest ayah يعني, found within it and other number of virtues so it can be disputed but they say قُلْ يَا الْكَافِرُونَ it was constantly read with Surah Al-Ikhlas when do you read Surah Al-Ikhlas with Surah قُلْ يَا الْكَافِرُونَ Huh? The sunnah. What sunnah? There are a number of sunnahs, brother. After Isha. Okay, mashallah. Before Fajr, the rak'ate before Fajr. Also, the brother said, maqam. After performing pilgrimage. And the brother says, after Maghrib. The sunnah after Maghrib. Mashallah. Now, some have authenticated the hadith that it took tablahu bara'ah. It will be written for him. Uh, innocence from shirk. These two surahs, there's a reason why they're read together. Yani ikhlas and qul ya yuhul kafirun. Surah al-ikhlas, the meaning of it, some of the scholars have said it is the meaning of it frees a person from shirk, polytheism. And also it grants sincerity to his reciter. Once the Prophet وسلم, came across a man reciting Qul huwa Allahu Ahad and he says, Innahu amana bi Rabbi. He is a person that has believed in his Lord. Meaning he is a man of sincerity. And also purifies one's knowledge with Allah Taala. Surah Al-Ikhlas. And they say, قُلْ يَا الْكَافِرُونَ purifies one's actions with Allah Taala. So one is concerning purifying your knowledge concerning Allah, what you believe concerning Allah. And قُلْ يَا الْكَافِرُونَ purifies your actions towards your Creator, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So one is affirming Tawheed and the other is negating Shirk. For that reason, from the names of Surah Al-Ikhlas is Surah Al-Tawheed. Comes the Hadith, the Prophet ﷺ named it Surah Al-Tawheed. There are approximately 20 odd names for Surah Al-Ikhlas. So this Surah is a prime example to understand the names and attributes of Allah Taala. And he says that it's Equivalent to a third of the Quran. How is it equivalent to a third of the Quran? Surah Al Ikhlas. Huh? Tfadl. Third of the Quran is about Tawheed, mashallah. So, uh, so the Quran, they say, is divided into three categories or three portions. A portion concerning rulings and verdicts that Allah gives and the second portion concerning his names and attributes and his oneness and concerning his oneness and the third one which is relating to the stories qasas mashallah qasas so these stories and others have said that it can be divided another way the second way can be divided the Quran is three ways that the Quran is either command or prohibition. The second one, 
that is either speaking about the creation, and the third way is speaking about the Creator. And in reality, they all mean the same to one another, if you look at it, from what it actually is aiming for. So these are the affairs that they mention. So this, and when we say it is equivalent to a third of the Qur'an, does this mean in fulfillment that if a person recites Qul Hu Allahu Ahad, he doesn't no longer need to recite Surah Al-Fatiha because he has read a third of the Qur'an? Could it suffice him from Fatiha? La, when you're reciting it, it doesn't mean in proportion, it means in reward. It means that you get the reward of reciting a third of the Qur'an. So the reward is great indeed. And this surah has been giving a description in some of the hadith as being sifatul rahman the attributes or the real description of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you're giving da'wah, whether it be to Christians or Jews or other members of faith, this is a good starting point. قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدٌ اللَّهُ صَمَدْ لَمْ يَلِدْ وَلَمْ يُولَدْ وَلَمْ يَكُلْ لَهُ كُفُوًا أَحَدٌ This is a beautiful starting point. Because why it comes that one of the reasons why this ayah was revealed is that the mushrikeen, the polytheists, they approached the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and said, Sif lana rabbak. Describe to us your Lord. So this ayah was revealed, Say, O Muhammad, Qul huwa Allahu ahad. And this came as a description of Allah ta'ala. So this is a prime example in how to explain your Creator to those who do not believe. قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ اللَّهُ صَمَدْ This surah, Surah Al-Ikhlas, it comes that a man, he would constantly recite it in Qiyam layl and in a state of repetition, just repeat it. Just reading that surah throughout the, his nights of Qiyam layl So one of the narrators of the hadith went to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the next morning and inquired about this. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he asked him about the surah he says I love it because it is the description of Rahman. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said Hubbuka iyaha adkhalaka al-jannah Your love for this surah entered you paradise. This shows you that the Qur'an, the surahs, they differ in its value and status. One surah is great and another greater. We say one ayah is great and another greater. So we don't come and say like the people of innovation that if we're saying that one surah is greater than another, that means we are degrading that verse we're speaking about, the other verse. So if we say Ayat al-Kursi is the greatest ayah, they come and say, here you're saying that the Qur'an has some deficiency in it. That one has perfection and another doesn't. This is their mentality, this is how they think. They always use their intellect and logic concerning affairs and they always use it to go against the text. A hadith comes that the Prophet wasallam says, what is the greatest ayah? He comes and says, you can't say the greatest ayah. He says, if we say in a greater ayah, that means the other one is not great. So we say, la, this is great and the other greater. This name of Allah is great and the other one is greater. So Surah Al-Ikhlas is greater than other surahs. The same way we say some prophets are greater than others. Have more yani, virtues than others. For example, Prophet Muhammad in sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when we say he's the most virtuous of prophets, it doesn't mean that we're degrading the other prophets. But if it comes to that state where you're giving so much virtue to one and degrading the other, there then it's not allowed. For that reason, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لا تفضلوني على يونس بن متى. 
Do not give preference of me over Prophet Yunus al Matta. Meaning, fearing that you're going to degrade a Prophet when mentioning my virtues and merits. You find that statement. So, same thing with these ayats. When we're speaking about one surah, it should not lead us to degrade another. Or either to disregard the other surahs. Some people now even go to Ruqya. They're so, yani, mashallah, overwhelmed with the virtues of one surah, one ayah. They don't use the other ayat or the other surahs. They disregard it totally. This is where it becomes a problem. This is where it can lead to you degrading a surah and disregarding it and even to the extent of boycotting it. So taking this affair seriously, that we believe that the Qur'an yitafadl. One is virtue, virtuous than the other, more virtuous than the other. So, Surah Al-Qur'an, the third of the Qur'an, we don't come and say like these new people that come and say, when you make the, when you do the math and you calculate and multiply the letters, it's equivalent, it adds up to being a third of the Qur'an. That is not what's intended here. And then they refer this as being a miraculous proof in the numeric or the numbers of the Qur'an. So this is not intended and this is not from the tafsir of the salaf. This is not from the understanding of the righteous verses. قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ So they say the... The virtue here, fil الْجَزَاء لا في الإجزاء. It is in the reward and not in the fulfillment. So if you recite this surah, does it suffice you from reciting uh, your portion of what you may do of trying to complete the Qur'an and your schedule, for example, monthly or every two, every two months? لا. That's not intended, indeed. Uh, another affair I want to mention, that they say one of the reasons why this surah is greater than other is because of the meaning that it bears. What is the meaning that it bears? It bears the meaning of tawheed. That's the greatest deed. That's the greatest thing you can speak about. This is the affair. That the Qur'an, the greatest part of it, is concerning this affair. Messengers, books were revealed. All of these people sacrificed their lives concerning this affair of Tawheed, of Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala, and clarifying it. Tayyib, we're going to... It's gonna, we're going to go into, the brother just reminded me, concerning the tafsir of these ayats now. So, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ The first word, قُلْ. The scholars, they say you take from this word, قُلْ, that the Prophet ﷺ was commanded to profess and proclaim his belief, his aqidah, and to stand open with it. This is what's upon a person. An yajhar bi aqidati. This kalima qul qala yushir al ilan wal jahar bi ma yataqid. Let him announce and speak openly. Let him proclaim. Let him go to the extent of being transparent with regarding what you believe. This is how it's upon each one of us that you have to be in a level where you can announce your belief. To the point that some scholars said, if you're in a state where you cannot even utter what you believe, it can be it could be wajib for you to perform hijrah. It could be wajib for you to perform hijrah. So announcing your belief is incumbent upon each one of us. From this ayah, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدُ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدُ This first name, Allah, starting with it, some scholars have said that it is the greatest name of Allah. It is the greatest name of Allah. 
and it's a name that could be compatible or can go along with every other attribute of Allah and other every name of Allah. Meaning all the names and attributes, they follow this name, the lofty name Allah. قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدٌ And the meaning of Allah is المأهلوه, the one that is worshipped with worshipped with rights Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala doing that being that he is deserving of it because of his perfection and qualities so قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدٌ Allah you can mention it along with any, any other name of Allah or any other attributes so for that reason, some have said it is the peak of all names, so it is the greatest of all names. And it comes in a hadith that a man made dua and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said concerning his dua لَقَدْ سَأَلْتَ Allah bi ismihi al-a'zam Indeed, you have asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with his greatest name. And the man, he comes to some of the narration, he says, أَسْأَلُكْ بِأَنَّكَ أَنْتَ اللَّهِ الْأَحَدُ الصَّمَدِ الَّذِي لَمْ يَلِدْ وَلَمْ يُلَدْ I ask you, being that you are Allah, الْأَحَدُ الصَّمَدِ الَّذِي لَمْ يَلِدْ وَلَمْ يُلَدْ And it comes to some narrations, أَسْأَلُكْ بِأَنَّكَ أَنْتَ اللَّهِ الْحَيُّ الْقَيُّمِ So for that reason, a group, or I would say a majority of the scholars, they, they say, and they incline to the opinion that the lofty name Allah is the greatest of names. قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ This word Ahad, what is the meaning of it? Huh? What is the meaning of Ahad? Huh? One, mashallah, jadid. You can translate it as one clarifying his oneness and that you can say also the unique one clarifying that it is he Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is unique. There's nothing similar to him. Some have said in the tafsir, Al-Ahad ay la masila la. Al-Ahad, nothing is comparable to him. He is alone in his names, his attributes. His actions, there is nothing that can be comparable to Allah. So, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ It starts off with affirming for Allah Taala His oneness. This affair, Al-Ahad, is the only time it's mentioned in the Qur'an in a context of praise, is this surah, describing Allah with Ahad. And it was not mentioned in any other part of the Qur'an except in a state of negation. فَلَا تَدْعُوا مَعَ اللَّهِ أَحَدًا Do not invoke along with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala anyone. So this word Ahad, when it's mentioned in a state of negation, then it is found in numerous verses of the Qur'an. But what about as a name. Generally, it can only be referred to Allah Taala. but there are instances where you can say about a particular day, Al-Ahad. Al-Ahad, for example, Sunday. They refer to it as Al-Ahad, meaning the one day that, that begins. So, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ As for the innovators, they have a lot of erroneous definitions concerning this name, Ahad. And they do this purposely so they could use it as a stepping stool to what they are aiming for to de- deviate the people. Qul huwa Allahu ahad. They say, for example, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the God that has no physical pillars, no physical appearances, uh, where they'll say, for example, Ahad, meaning he has no specific direction that he's in, 
All of this they use just to incline to what they're aiming for, to deny the names and attributes of Allah. قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ اللَّهُ صَمَدْ What is the meaning of Samad? Al-Maqsood fil Hawaid, mashallah. The so brother mentioned the one that people yani, uh, return back to to fulfill their needs. That's one meaning, mashallah. Allahu Samad. But what if you were to come and say the meaning of Allahu Samad is Lam Yalid wa Lam Yulid? That's a nice definition. You can't go wrong with that. Some scholars, they said, the meaning of Allah Samad is what comes after it. Lam yalid, wa lam yulid. Alright, MashaAllah. The, another meaning is that Allah Samad, the one that is, is complete in independence. In independence. And that he is all sufficient. And that all of creation at large are in need of him and they rely upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahu Samad, some have said it means la jawfala, the one that doesn't eat or drink. That all, all these explanations, some of the Mashayikh <laughs> say they all yani, land on one main meaning that clarifies that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all-sufficient and the maintainer for His creation. The maintainer of His creation. So, لَمْ يَلِدْ وَلَمْ يُولَدْ لَمْ يَلِدْ وَلَمْ يُولَدْ Why does it begin with لَمْ يَلِدْ before لَمْ يُولَدْ? Huh? Tfadl. Okay, so why doesn't it start with he wasn't begotten? The father first before yani, uh, being uh, having one that was begotten or born. Why was that n- n- it's not started as a negation, negation first? Huh? Allah knows best, but they say Lam Yalid because the main misconception concerning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, especially in the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was them ascribing for him a son that he begets. As for that he was begotten, that was an accusation that almost, yani, uh, almost doesn't, wasn't, didn't exist, it was non-existent. Lam yulad, that he was begotten, that God born was born, that accusation, it didn't exist, but they said it was mentioned here in Bab Taqid to emphasize that he doesn't, he wasn't, uh, he doesn't beget, he doesn't give uh, birth, and he wasn't one that was born. وَلَمْ يَكُلْ لَهُ كُفُوًا أَحَدْ And this response to the allegations made by the Christians and also the Jews. I would say it only as well with the Jews, the allegation of the Jews. This is a response, huh? Uzair is the son of Allah. So people assume that this is only relating to the allegation of the Christians. وَلَمْ يُولَدْ وَلَمْ يَكُلْ لَهُ كُفُوًا أَحَدْ Okay, what's the meaning of وَلَمْ يَكُلْ لَهُ كُفُوًا أَحَدْ why didn't we mention that the origin concerning negation, negating uh, the defects and the deficiencies from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is usually mentioned generally. It's usually expressed generally in the Quran. Why is it here mentioned specifically? He doesn't beget and he wasn't begotten. Why is this specific, specifically? Who could answer? Huh? Told him. Some reasons uh, that you can have is from the last class, con- the conjugal refutation of the third, also from the opposite. Naam, mashallah, that's true. He mentioned that go here as a refutation to some of the misconceptions. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sometimes specifically negates something in particular to refute a misconception that has been 
widespread amongst the people. And the second reason, to affirm its opposite. What's the opposite of lam yalid wa lam yulad? Tamam ul ghina. That he is completely independent. That he's completely independent, Allah Tabarak wa ta'ala. So when you notice that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala specifically negates something, it could be for yani a particular reason, such as to refute a misconception or to affirm its opposite. And that was mentioned in the previous session. So, when we're speaking about here describing Allah, we have people now that come and say that you haven't glorified Allah in His due manner. They say, وَمَا قَدْرُ اللَّهَ حَقَّ قَدْرِ You haven't glorified Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in His due manner. Allah is greater to be described. They come with this, this doubt. They say, Allah is greater to be described. How are you describing Him? This is, brings deficiency. Or they'll say like the Majus. Allah is greater to be worshipped. So they went and started to worship what? The sun. This is their doubt. So these people, they say Allah is greater to, to be described. He doesn't need to be described by us. Or His qualities need to be mentioned. This is their doubt. We respond by saying, it is He alone that described Himself. And also revealed to His noble messenger to describe Him. It wasn't us that described Him. We didn't come with these attributes from ourselves. It is Him, the Magnificent, who described Himself. So we haven't fell into this eye that you claim, وَمَا قَدَرُ اللَّهَ حَقَّ قَدْرِ <clears throat> Tayyib also, as a side benefit, the word... Uh, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ أَحَدْ Some have said it means the one who is complete in all of his names and attributes. The Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reach the ultimate level of perfection in his names and attributes. So these are the people who come and say, how could you say that that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He has reached the ultimate level or the ultimate peak of perfection, His name. Or this name is greater than the other. Or there's no restriction. Because I believe the, the, what they say, the scientists, that uh, infinity, anything beyond infinity, cancels out or something. They're trying to use these uh, principles that they learned, and they apply it to what? The names of Allah. So they're saying here, these names, if you say that, they're counseling out one another. What a shame. The one who taught you how to read and write, you're using that same intellect that he has given you to reject what he has taught you. It's a shame indeed. قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدُ اللَّهُ صَمَدْ لَمْ يَلِدْ وَلَمْ يُولَدْ وَلَمْ يَكُلْ لَهُ كُفُوَةْ أَحَدُ So now this is a general negation. There is nothing uh, as an equal for him. There's nothing as an equal for him. Kufu one, a an equal, a partner, a match for Allah Tabarak wa Taala. So it shows us that when we're between one of the two, we affirm and we negate. The word, even our shahada, is between affirmation and negation. When we say, La ilaha illallah, what is it between? Us affirming and us negating. We negate that there's none deserving of worship and truth except who? <coughs> Allah Taala. So even regarding your shahada, when you make shahada, you're between one of the two. Along with the names of Allah Taala, you're between affirming and negating. As you affirm, you have to negate. So when you're affirming something for Allah, you negate the imperfections, and him having yani similar uh, qualities to his creation. So this is the affair of Surah Al-Ikhlas, in short. We've, alhamdulillah, taken it more 
of its uh, details in previous sessions. So we're going to move forward, inshallah. So the next ayah, I'm going to read it again. And, uh, وَصَفَ بِهِ نَفْسَهُ فِي عَظِمِ آيَةٍ فِي كِتَابِهِ As well, what he has attributed to himself in the greatest ayah of his noble book. So if you can read that uh, with the translation, I'm going to read, uh, يَقُولُ الله, اللَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُوَ الْحَيُّ الْقَيُّومِ لَا تَأْخُذُهُ سِنَةٌ وَلَا نَوْمٌ له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض من ذا الذي يشفع عنده إلا بإذنه يعلم ما بين أيديهم وما خلفهم ولا يحيطون بشيء من علمه إلا بما شاء وسع كرسيه السماوات والأرض ولا يؤده حفظهما وهو العلي العظيم أي لا يكرثه ولا يسقله Allah, there is none worthy of worship and truth except Him, the living, the eternal. Neither slumber nor sleep overtakes Him. Unto Him belongs whatsoever is in the heavens and the earth. Who is He who intercedes with Him except by His permission? He knows that which is before them and that which is behind them. While they encompass nothing of His knowledge except what He wills, His seat contains the heavens and the earth, and He is very worthy of preserving them. He is the sublime and great. Tayyib, this ayah, it mentions that it's the greatest ayah in the Qur'an. It has a story about it, about this statement of the Prophet ﷺ being the greatest ayah in the Qur'an. The Prophet ﷺ said to Sayyid al-Qurra, the greatest of the learned from the reciters in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, Ubay ibn Ka'ab. His nickname is Sayyid al-Qurra. He asked him, أَيُّ آيَةٍ مَعَكَ مِنْ كِتَابِ اللَّهِ أَعْظَمْ Which ayat do you have with you that is considered to be the greatest? Look at this question. How many ayats are in the Qur'an? Over 6,000 ayat. And he's asking this companion, this sahabi, what is the greatest ayah that you have from 6,000 ayat on the spots there. Look at uh, the answer of this noble Sahabi. He says, Allahu wa Rasulu Ali. Out of him not putting himself forward before Allah and his messenger, he answers firstly by saying, although he was from the most from prominent reciters in the time of the Prophet. He was at the peak of the reciters. He was referred to as Sayyid al qurra he was the man that knew the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in and out, meaning he has mastered it in his recitation. Yet at the same time, he says, Allah wa Rasuluhu alam. Allah and his messenger knows best. Then after that, the Prophet sallallahu insisted, what is the greatest ayah that you have from the book of Allah? So there then he knew that the Prophet sallallahu was insisting. So he said, Ayatul uh, Kursi. He said, Allahu la ilaha illahu hayyun qayyum. He read Ayatul Kursi. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam there then, striking his, uh, his chest or tapped his chest, and he said, made dua for him, or he congratulated him, saying, Congratulate upon you, knowledge. That this shows you. The, how the Sahabas used to immense the importance of Tawheed from the bottom of their heart. Out of 6,000 ayat, he comes out and chooses the greatest ayah in the Tawheed of Allah. It shows you that the Sahabas, when they used to recite the Qur'an, they used to ponder over it. They used to intake its meanings. For that reason... They say that Surah Al-Baqarah was revealed on the Prophet ﷺ during a period of 10 years in Medina. How long did he spend in Medina? Huh? How long did he spend in Medina? 10 years, right? So from the beginning of his time from Medina till the end, till the last verse that was revealed in the Qur'an from Surah Al-Baqarah, 
is constantly revealed. The Prophet says, ten years. So it shows you that this Quran requires time. It requires you to give it a time where you ponder over it when reading it. It is a talent that people can master its recitation. But the main question, could you really intake its meanings and ponder over it as those before? This is important that we give this time. So they say about Ayat al-Kursi, it is Ajma'ul Ayat fi Tawheed. It is the greatest of ayat that encompasses the meaning of Tawheed of Allah. So this affair, they say it contains 20 attributes of Allah in this ayah. Ishroon sifa for Allah. And five of the greatest names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this ayah. It begins with two. And it ends with two, and also it mentions another. In fact, some of the scholars say it contains two of the great names that the scholars have disputed, which is which of the two is the referred to as Ismuhu al azam the greatest name of Allah. Also, they say, one of the Mashaykh has a booklet on this, it contains Ashara, it contains 10 proofs and concrete evidence for the Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. From the beginning of Ayat al-Kursi to the end of it. So he mentioned one by one. Each one is a concrete evidence for the Tawheed of Allah, the oneness of Allah. So this ayah, Ayat al-Kursi, the affair of it, Yeah, and it's not hidden to many of you. They said it is the, the ayah that is perhaps memorized by every Muslim all over the world. Even some, the, first, the second thing that they memorize from the Quran after Fatiha is perhaps Ayat al-Kursi. Somewhere. So Ayat al-Kursi, it's hidden, his virtue is not hidden from many of you. So here he emphasizes, even in the greatest eye of the Qur'an, this layout of these principles of the names of Allah and the attributes of Allah, how we believe them, is found in this ayah. We haven't made this up. Nowadays they say our belief is taken from Imam Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab, rahimahullah. The reviver of Tawheed in the 12th century of his time, in his era. They say this man came and brought these principles that the people believe. Here, Sheikh Islam and Taymiyyah, years before even Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab was born, uttering these statements. And even those before him, the likes of Imam Ahmed, Imam al-Shafi'i, Imam Malik, and the rest of the Imams, all of them inclined to this. Inclined to this. So, <clears throat> This ayah, Ayatul Kursi, some have narrated stories of its impact. This, the impact that it has by Allah. You're going to notice at the end, the Shaykh, he says, وَلِهَذَا كَانَ مَنْ قَرَأَ هَذِي الْآيَةَ فِي لَيْلَةٍ لَمْ يَزَلْ عَلَيْهِ مِنَ اللَّهِ حَافِظٌ وَلَا يَقْرَبُهُ وَلَا يَقْرَبُهُ شَيْطَانٌ حَتَّى يُصْبِحْ Hold on. Therefore Allah protects whoever reads this ayah at night and no devil can, close, can get close to him until morning. Allah has also said, Be upon the living one, he who will never die. So from the impact of this ayah, for those who read it in a state of awareness, if you read this ayah, ayat al-kursi, while you're heedless, you're, ma- you're absent-minded, your mind is somewhere else while you're reading it, just words that you're merely uttering. Here then, it doesn't benefit you at all. Perhaps, perhaps maybe you just get the reward of just reading it. But as for the protection, be protected from the devil coming near to you as coming in the hadith, that is something that you'll be deprived from because you're absent-minded while reading it. 
to the point that some of the scholars said that the one who recites this ayah before going to bed, he's protected from the shaitan putting knots over his head and urinating in his ears as come in some of the hadith. Or being any sort of harm to him and his family where they, he can physically harm. So they said, as in Hajar, al Murad al Qurb al Hissi. Actual nearness where he's really close to you, he can really harm you physically. That type of harm is negated by the recitation. So, and I use the proof to say that it's only restricted to uh, those of his servants when they recite it. They are attentive to what they're reciting. They're reciting and recalling it from their heart. They use the ayah, Inna ibadi laysa laka alayhim sultan. Verily my servants, and the word servants here, the scholar says, Ibadi al ibad al-dhakirun. Those who remember Allah with their heart and their tongue. You have no way over them, Allah says. Inna ibadi laysa laka alayhim sultan. So those who are real servants of Allah Taala, when they utter these words, they protect, they're protected from the shaitan. So Ayat al-Kursi, here the shaykh mentions one scenario where it's recited. At night when going to bed. How many other times is it recited, Ayat al-Kursi? Huh? After every salat. After every salat, okay, that's five times. So now we have five plus uh, one six, okay? MashaAllah. It comes in hadith that reciting. Well, give us another one, Yusuf. Huh? No, I think, I think you're the wrong. It comes in a hadith, Abi, Abi Umam, I believe. If a person recites it after every salat, nothing will get between him and entering Jannah except him dying. If you constantly recite this ayah, but. It says some in a hadith, wherever man qara'ahu fi laylatin amina aminahu Allah wa aminahu Allah wa amana Allah ala darihi wa ala jarihi wa duwayrat hawlahu. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants protection for him, and not only for him, for his household, and not only for his household, for his neighbors, and not only for his neighbors, even the houses beyond that. That hadith is not authentic. Enough. Uh, also the hadith are saying if a person recites ayat to kursi when performing hijama it's like he performed hijama twice that is also a weak hadith there's a lot of hadith concerning the virtues of ayat to kursi extremely weak that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala written ayat to kursi in a particular way from a particular material all of those hadith are weak Tayyib, why was it called Ayat al-Kursi? Why was it called Ayat al-Kursi? Why was it called Ayat al-Kursi? Hold on. Huh? The verse of the throne. The verse of the throne, mashallah. So uh, Kursi means throne to you, huh? Okay, that's... Tayyib, mashallah. Anything else? Because it's the only ayah in the whole Quran that has the word Kursi. It's a benefit. It is the only time that is mentioned in the Qur'an, for that reason it was given a name. Sometimes the names of certain ayat, or certain surahs, they come either through a story that's constantly mentioned therein, or a specific word that is only mentioned therein and is not mentioned in other surahs. So these are some of the reasons. Like Surah Al-Baqarah, because of the story of the cow, that's commonly mentioned of the, sur- the stories of Musa alayhi salam. So th- this is important. And the meaning of al-kursi is the footstool. A footstool. And it's different from the throne of Allah. Al-arsh. Al-arsh wal kursi shay. The throne of Allah is something and the kursi is something else. And we say concerning that it comes in a narration that the footstool, it is, yani, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it comes in some narrations, yani, 
يعني السماوات والأرض بنسبة الكرسي كحلقة ملقاة في أرض فلا. That the comparison of the heavens, despite its size, and the earth, in, uh, in comparison to the kursi, is like a ring thrown in the middle of the desert. A middle, the big open desert. And then it is up there. And, in, and the comparison of the kursi, the footstool, to the throne is like that ring, kahalqa fi ardin falah. Yani, it's like the example of uh, that ring to the whole desert. So the arsh, the arsh of Allah is the greatest of the makhluqat. The greatest of the creations of things that have been created is the throne of Allah Taala, and it is the highest of all creation. There's nothing beyond the throne of creation. So it's two different things. And the kursi, it comes a narration on Abbas from his statement that he says, Al-Kursi, Mawzi' Qadami' Ar-Rahman, or Mawzi' Al-Qadamin. It is the, basically the footstool, and it comes with some wordings, the footstool of Allah. And it comes with some wordings, the two feet of Allah. The footstool of the two feet of Allah. Yani, some have have taken from this that this wouldn't come out of his own statement, be deprived from his own ishtihad, has to be something that he took from the Prophet ﷺ. So here then we affirm for Allah what comes in this hadith. And some have said it's possible that he has taken it from the those who used to narrate narratives of children of Israel. So in all cases, we affirm that Ayatul Kursi is the footstool of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the meaning of kursi, al kursi, and some have come from the people of innovation. They say, no, it's not a footstool, brother. Kursi means al ilm, knowledge, the knowledge of Allah. Subhanallah. Where did you get share footstool to knowledge? And that's a big jump. So we say to them, ya yuladina amanu, la tuqaddimu bain yadehi lahi, bain yadehi lahi rasuli. Or you who believe, do not put yourself forward before Allah and His Messenger. What is the meaning of that? Surah Al Hujarat. Oh, you who believe, do not put yourself forward before Allah and His Messenger. And the scholars of Tafsir say, meaning, Do not say anything about the deen of Allah or about the attributes of Allah or the names of Allah up until Allah says it or His Messenger says it. This is the belief of Ahl Sunnah to Jama'ah. This is our proof. Why are you only affirming what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala affirmed or His Messenger affirmed? Because it says, O oh, you who believe, do not put yourself before Allah and His Messenger. We're not putting ourselves before Allah and His Messenger. It's called the same meaning, do not say anything until Allah says. That is our aqidah, this is our proof. They can call us all the names they want. Yani, uh, I think from their names they say is uh, the blasphemers, the mushabbiha, those who resemble Allah to His creations, the what's the other word? Al Mujassima, how do they translate it? As Arthur Morpheus. What does that mean? Arthur Morpheus, or whatever they say. Those words, as uh, it comes a beautiful statement, I'm going to allow the brother to read it. Of Ibn Qayyim, where he ascribes, he responds to their. This nickname calling. It's like a child game. They're just calling names. Bring forth your proofs if you're truthful. Calling names all day on YouTube or this or that, there's no benefit. Yani, uh, this is what people used to do yani, uh, as children. When, or now a time when a person has no result, uh, no resort of academic proofs, he resorts to calling names. And that's the easiest weapon to. But you can read this part, Shana. Ibn Qayyim, when he said, if being anthropomorphous means affirming the divine attributes and regarding them as being above the interpretation of a liar, then praise be to Allah. I am an anthropomorphist 
Bring your witnesses. Yani, similar to as Imam Shafi'i, when they accuse him to be a Rafidi, he says, In kana hubbu ali Muhammadin rafdun, fal yashhad al-thaqalani anni rafidu. If, yani, uh, if, the word uh, Rafidism, if loving the family of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is considered to be amongst the Rafidah or uh, that which resembles them, then let man and jinn bear witness that I'm a Rafid. This is it. If these people want to yani, call us names because of what we believe, we say, okay, if you calling, if this name means that us believing in what Allah believes, or what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has affirmed for himself and his messenger, then bear witness on whatever you call me. Call me what you want. At the end of the day, it is the facts that matter. It's the facts that matter. It's not about name calling. So this is very important. And also, these people that say you've you've put yourself forward before Allah. Another group comes and says you have put yourself forward before Allah. You're you're speaking about that the literal meaning of these words are intended. Without knowing its actuality, the true, uh, or the natural essence of how it occurs. So we asked them, what's the meaning of the word Jannah? What does Jannah mean? What does the Jannah mean? Guardians. But what's the actual meaning of it? Jannah? Huh? Follow that which is hidden, a prize that is hidden. A prize that is hidden. Even the word jinn, it means something that is hidden to the eyes. So we just tell them, okay, you, every day you're saying jannah, something that is hidden. Do you know what the actuality of jannah? Can you describe the actuality of it, the natural essence of it? He'll tell you no. Because Allah says in the hadith, I prepared for my servants what the eye has not seen or ear has heard or anything has come to mind. Also Allah says, فَلَا تَعْلَمُ نَفْسٌ مَا أُخْفِيَ لَهُمْ مِنْ قُرَّةِ عَيْهُمْ A soul does not know what has been prepared for him of that which is coolness to his eyes. So you don't know what is in the actuality of Jannah. With greater preference, you don't know the natural essence concerning the attributes of Allah. So why do you try to put yourself forward? So these are very important that everything that we believe is Yani taken from the book and the sunnah. The book and the sunnah. Nowadays, they cut clips, these people, and they spread it all over the social media. And they'll say, yani, the sheikh is resembling Allah to, the, to have human futures. And some of them, they, they come with this doubt to say, why does Allah give us characteristics that the humans have. Why does Allah mention certain attributes that the humans have? Why couldn't He mention attributes that the human don't have? This is there. They're asking Allah. They're objecting to Allah. This is a reason. When you have so much doubts in this matter, it leads to you to object to Allah. So, yani, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke and addressed the people with a language and what's what they understand. Because these names and attributes has an effect. If we know that He's merciful, and we understand the meaning of merciful, we draw nearer to Allah in repentance. If we know the meaning of uh, Almighty, we fear His wrath. But for Allah to to mention names that have, that their meanings are not understood to us, the attributes are not understood to us, what effects is going to have on creation? So these people, they object to the wisdom of Allah Taala, And in fact, they are to be questioned, not Allah. And lastly, we're going to end because the time is uh, another affair. Is Some of them, concerning some attributes, they want to object. They'll say to you, uh, when you say Allah has a hand, 
it goes against the ayah, laysa kamithili shay. Nothing resembles. Because they say the human has a hand too. You just went against the ayah. You just said there's nothing like to him, and you mentioned that Allah has a hand, and humans have a hand too. So we tell him, okay, in the, in the rest of the ayah, who is Samir al-Basir? So all hearing and all seer. Does Allah have uh, the attributes of hearing? They say, yeah, Allah has the attribute of hearing. But doesn't the humans have the attribute of hearing as well? They say, yes. So didn't you just contradict yourself with the ayah? They say, you keep quiet. This is how many of them were defeated in this debate. So when you use your logic concerning these affairs, you become really confused and you start to contradict yourself. Some of them have even left Islam in totality. Do not try to yani, be of those who ponder and use his intellect as a source of reference concerning his creator. Do not use your intellect concerning greater. So uh, this is one affair concerning uh, Ayatul Kursi. The word here, Al-Hayyul Qayyum, the ever-living and the sustainer of all, Al-Qayyum, the one that is independent in himself and sustains the affairs of all. Some have said these two names together, they make up the greatest name of Allah. So when you're making dua and you want to call out to the greatest name of Allah, add them together. Al Hayyul Qayyum. Ya Allah Al Hayyul Qayyum. And this word uh, Al Qayyum is mentioned how many times in the Quran? This name Al Qayyum. Huh? How many times? Two times. Okay, mashallah. Okay, mention those two. Second ayah of Ali Imran, mashallah. Ayat al Kursi, mashallah. One more. Surah Taha, give us an ayah, Surah Taha. وَعَنَتِ الْوُجُوهُ لِلْحَيِّ الْقَيُّومِ وَقَدْ خَابَ مَنْ حَمَلَ ظُلْمًا so uh, it, this name Al Qayyum is mentioned three times in the Quran, and it comes in a hadith specifically mentioned that it was specifically mentioned three times. A group of the scholars inclined to it being the greatest name of Allah. What's the benefit of knowing that it's the greatest name of Allah? These are uh, s- subjects and discussions that scholars constantly speak about. What is the greatest name of Allah? What is, what is the main benefit behind this? Huh? That when you know, especially, that this is the greatest name of Allah, it gives greater chance for your du'a to be answered when you call upon it. And also it brings you nearness to Allah in having knowledge concerning His greatest name. The more knowledgeable you are concerning His names, the more it will have an impact on yourself. You'll find you living up to these names, to its effects in your daily lives, inshallah. So al-hayy al-qayyum la ta'khudhuhu sinatun wa la nawm we're not going to do the whole ayah forgive us yani it's a tafsir of that we already taken the session of ayat kursi in previous classes we're just going to mention some important highlights and then we'll end there if the brothers can pardon us it says he's not overtaken by slumber or sleep and some have translated as drowsiness or sleep sina the scholars have said, if you look at the beginning of Ayatul Kursi, it coincides with the end of it. It starts off by mentioning two beautiful names, and it ends with mentioning two beautiful names. It also, secondly, mentions the affair that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not taken by slumber or drowsiness or sleep. And then at the end, also on the end, it mentions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not fatigued by guarding and maintaining the affairs of the heavens and earth. So these affairs, if you look at uh, coincide with one another, there's, there's books have been written 
concerning how one ayah relates to the other, and so on. So, لَا تَأْخُذُهُ سِنَةٌ وَلَا نَوْمٌ as we mentioned here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is specifically negating. What is the reason here? Isn't the origin that we generally negate for Allah, deficiency and imperfections? Why is it specifically? Anyone, huh? Anyone, huh? You answered already. I mean, huh? MashaAllah, okay, that's one. Tayyib. Anything else? It's a form of reputation. It's a form of reputation, Abbas. Tayyib, mashallah. And enter from the opposite of the world. So, a form that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the opposite attributes of being all aware. All aware. And it's not taken by deficiency through sleep or fatigue or to be in a state of drowsiness. As one that people, uh, the human mind, and their state between themselves is that when one is guarding and maintaining something so great a responsibility, the first thing they're taken by is drowsiness. And then there comes after a gnome, sleep. And sleep is the sister of what? Death. Of death. When you're going to sleep, it's a mini version of death. It's a mini version of death. Basically, you're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if you release yani, my soul and let me to live, then preserve it. And if you continue to withhold it, then have mercy upon it amongst the souls that you have mercy upon. So it's a mini version of death. So alhamdulillah, it mentions that his, his, his uh, kursi, his footstool, extends over the heavens and the earth. Some translations it encompasses the heavens and the earth. So meaning that it is yeah, and it's great, so great in its width that it extends over the heavens and earth, and it's above the heavens and earth. So a person understands how great the size of uh, the kursi of Allah Tabaraku Ta'ala. And another affair. It says at the end, whoever recites this ayah, shaitan will not come near him. A shaitan will not come near him. Uh, this affair it's uh, it's very important that we understand it that uh, shaitan will not come near him. Some have said that this uh, guardian at his presence is a malaika. Whenever the malaika are around, these devils that are out to cause corruption, they're not present. So whenever a person is in his home and he prevents it, for, for example, to have pictures or dogs, these malaika of mercy are around and the shayateen of corruption and filth, they are absent. So this is very important to understand that yes, the shaitan who is there to whisper may be present. But the shaitan that is out to harm the person physically. And there are different shayateen. Even comes to some of the narrations that one of the one of them was who gave his hand to a Sahabi, and his hand was yani, similar to a hand of an animal, and his fur was similar to a fur of an animal. So, and then he said, "Lakad alimatil jinn anni ashadhum." The jinn have come to know that I am the strongest of them. So there are different levels, and then he mentioned what can protect you from me is reciting Ayatul Kursi. And that has all a different topic that we'll maybe speak in other sessions. If the shayateen can be seen in, the, in these images or not. So we end, inshallah, with these affairs. Alhamdulillah, I think we've understood. Uh,
pertaining to what was mentioned. So we're taking from uh, Ayat to Kursi what the Sheikh is highlighting. Is the principle is that Ahl Sunnah are in between affirming and negating. If you understood that, then alhamdulillah, today's class is understood. That we're between affirmation and negation. The same way our shahad is between affirmation and negation, this is our hard belief. We affirm and negate. When do we affirm? We affirm when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala affirms and His Messenger, and we negate when Allah and His Messenger negate. Anything beyond that, we remain silent. Even if they try to push us and they give us certain words, sensitive words, are you saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not, uh, is like this and that? He said, brother, we only affirm what Allah is affirming and negates what Allah is negating. But what do you mean by that? If he comes to uh, give you a portray of some evil meaning there, then we say Allah is free from that, exalted is he. So be careful when they come with these, yani, uh, unambiguous words or vague terms just to d- deceive the people, to deny the attributes of Allah. We end with this amount. Inshallah, if there's any questions, then I believe it's sufficient. Aqeedat al Alhamdulillah, it's simple. It is a simple text. Don't get me wrong, it's a simple text. Uh, it's it just contains ayat and a hadith. Ayat that we constantly recite. But there are, we're just mentioning with side benefits. So if you don't get some of these side benefits, love us. The main thing you understand, the principles that are being mentioned. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's names are names of perfection. They contain no deficiency. So for that reason, we affirm for imperfection and negate for him defects. And we say there's no resemblance within all of that to his creation. Alhamdulillah. Qudhi al-amru ladhi fihi tastafdiyan. Subhanak Allah bihamdik. Nashadu an la ilaha. Astaghfiruka wa natubu ilayhi.